Hi, welcome to another Now Playing vlog where I talk about some of the games that I've been playing lately and what I think of them. This video wouldn't exist without the support of my Patreon backers. If you'd like to help Actual LOL grow bigger and better, go to patreon.com forward slash actual LOL. There are links to where you can buy all the games mentioned in this video in the description below. Let's get on with it. Pyramid of the Pen Queen is from Brain Games. This is a one versus many game of hidden movement, really. It's actually based on an older game called Fluke de Mumie. This is a re-theme of it. It's now in the Ice Cool universe. Brain Games have a very successful dexterity game called Ice Cool with these really cute penguins in it. And now we have Pyramid of the Pen Queen. The way it works is that you've got this 3D board. It's a vertical board that's magnetic. And so one player is playing on one side with a big magnet and the other players are playing on the other side and they are trying to move around this temple and get the objects they need to win the game whilst the mummy on the other side can't see where they're moving but is trying to find them around these pathways and catch them and when they catch them it's brilliant because the magnets jump onto uh the things you can see the mummy moving around and get close to you and you're really scared that, that it's going to come and get you it works really nicely. Each player has a set of treasures that they need to get, which are shown on the map. And they are in five different sections matching a color. So once they've got all of those treasures, they win the game. The penguins are working against each other, but they are having to collaborate at times because if they get caught a certain number of times in a five player game, I think it's seven times, then the mummy wins the game. And that's a really interesting uh, dynamic I find because it means that taking risks is you're more likely to win the game as a penguin but if you take too many you could cost the game for every other player you have to decide when's the right time to visit certain regions based on where the, the mummy is on your turn as a penguin you roll the dice and you can pick one of those dice to move a certain number of spaces so the dice might say four and you tell the mummy you're moving four spaces they just don't know where everyone takes a turn and then the mummy gets a turn to move and they get to roll their own dice but they add it to a certain number of symbols of locked dice so when the penguins are rolling their dice some of those dice will lock with these masks on them that means that they have limited options um, so when it's the mummy's turn they get way more movement the penguins will need to at some point unlock those dice. They might potentially do it to screw over one of their other penguins because the mummy might be really near them and they can kind of force the mummy to move halfway through the round. Or they might just have to do it because all the dice are now locked. There's another side of the dice which is an arrow that just means that you're going to move all the way in one direction to the end so that can kind of screw with the mummy's deduction. The mummy is trying to work out where the penguins are they do get some information. So when a penguin collects a treasure, they have to reveal it immediately. So you immediately know that that penguin is in that spot. So generally you're only gonna collect a treasure when you're far away and safe from the mummy so they can't get you. That of course you then know where they are so you can head towards them. You then of course know what other color treasures they're gonna need. So you can try and work out what region they might be in. And you also know how many spaces they've moved so you can use that a little bit to get some information. It's a great challenge. You feel completely in the dark, but the feeling of kind of piecing together some information and then that magnet clicking just feels great as the mummy. And then as the penguins, of course, there's a huge amount of tension, just like there is in any hidden movement game. Also, when you make your decisions, you're trying to outthink them. Do you go slightly away from where you want to go just because you think that's probably not where the mummy would head, that isn't their usual pathway? Or do you just go with the obvious thing and try and do it as quickly as possible? Really fun time I've had with this game. It definitely gets a seal of actual love. It's got a wonderful production, great table presence, it's really quick. The first time I played, it was actually on my birthday. We had this awesome games day and I just wanted to play again immediately because it was just such a blast and everyone else felt the same. It looks and feels like a kid's game, but it absolutely works with adults as well. Has definitely a great amount of challenge and decision making for both sides and just a fun amount of tension and excitement in quite a short game. So yeah, it's top marks really. 
that's Pyramid of the Pen Queen. Rising 5 Runes of Asteros is a cooperative deduction game with an app. The core basic thing of Rising 5 is that you're trying to solve this puzzle. There's seven different coloured runes. You need to work out which four colours are going to be in the puzzle and then in which order. And the way you're doing that is by testing against the app to see and get information back and then use that information to work out how to get the puzzle correct. Whilst you're doing all of that, there's a whole nother game around it. So you have these characters that are then having to visit locations to collect these cubes that allow you to test the puzzle. So it's, it's interesting. It wraps a whole nother game around the basic deduction because it kind of needs to it because otherwise you would solve the puzzle quite quickly. It's quite simple. The way I would imagine it is that you're trying to defuse a bomb and whilst you're, you know how to defuse the bomb, but whilst you're trying to defuse it, people are shooting at you and you've kind of got to deal with the people shooting at you before you can get back to the bomb each time. In a similar way, there's these monsters that are attacking you at these different locations on the board. You have to send the characters around uh, to try and kill them. And so the way you take your turn is by playing these character action cards and you play as many cards matching the character as actions you want to take. So you'll move and you'll attack or you'll use a card to collect the cubes that you need or to get a clue about the puzzle. Um, and there's some interesting cooperation with the other players because when you go and uh, attack a monster, other players can also contribute the same card to help you with the dice roll because every time you attack a monster, you roll a dice and they can help mitigate that roll. There is one roll which is an auto fail no matter how many cards you played, which is really frustrating and I could imagine would turn off some players. It certainly creates some tension, but I've lost games over that die roll and it can be a bit frustrating to have it in a game where you feel like a deduction game is all about kind of thinking and you, and you know that you're onto the puzzle and yet you've got this other thing holding you back and then to have that luck aspect in it where you get these auto fails, and there's nothing you can do about it. I think some people are going to find that frustrating. I didn't mind it too much. It certainly added to the tension every time that you roll the die. Um, but the, the cooperative game in general is, is solid. It does feel like a kind of classic pandemic style co co cooperative game in the sense that it has that type of puzzle to it. You have to work out how best and efficient to use your characters, which character power is going to be most suited here. I've got these cards, you've got those cards. How can we most efficiently use the cards that we have? That in itself is clever. It just feels like a bit of distraction from the puzzle that you want to be doing. When you've collected the cubes that you need, you'll put them into the app and the app will tell you whether what you've got right about the puzzle. The trouble is, is that the runes are represented in the app by different animal symbols that you don't know which connects. So it's another kind of layer of misunderstanding that you have to learn more. So as you go through the game, you'll kind of be swapping icons out, runes out, and trying to work out which is connected to which. And then it will give you information. It will either tell you about this specific animal symbol, whether it's in the puzzle, uh, whether it's in the puzzle but in the wrong place, and whether it's just not in the puzzle at all. And so at the start of the game, you get information about the runes that you have there, but you of course don't know which animal relates to which rune. And so you don't, you know maybe that two of those symbols should be there, but they're not in the right place. And you've got to solve it as quickly as possible with as little change and as little clues because the time is ticking down really. All these monsters um, that are attacking, all of the action cards that you're playing, if you get to the end of the action deck, you lose the game. So there's a lot to keep track of. It's definitely not an easy game. And we found that it's also quite a short game. So we found that you kind of lose once and then you immediately just want to go again because you're so frustrated because often you feel close with the solving of the puzzle. Like you, you think you've got the puzzle, but you get so distracted by that that you wasted too much time trying to collect the cubes that allow you to solve the puzzle, that you didn't worry about the monsters and then they defeated you and, and you lost the game. And that really sums up my issue of the game really, is that it's a perfectly fine cooperative game and challenging and 
really does promote discussion and cooperation, but the outer ring of the game dealing with the monsters feels like a distraction from the real puzzle. I totally understand why it needs to be there, but I would rather play a game that was all about the deduction and this one just doesn't offer that. So I, I think uh, it's a really clever, interesting game. It's got some wonderful artwork and the, the use of the app works in the sense of you don't have to, you know, like it's able to randomize it for you and make it a different challenge each time. Um, so I've enjoyed my time with it, but it's not one that I, is going to stick around in my collection. That's Rising 5 Runes of Asteros. Not So Fast is a speed grabbing reaction game. If you've ever played Ghost Blitz or Jungle Speed, it's inspired by that, but it really adds some stuff to the equation. In the game, you've got these wonderful wooden nuts. So you've got these really cute uh, representations of cashew nuts, an almond, a pistachio, and some walnuts. You are taking it in turns to flip over a card from your deck in front of yourself. Uh, you're actually flipping over two. And as soon as there are four nuts shown of the same type, but exactly four, not three or not five or six, then you have to race to grab. Everyone is racing to grab that nut. What I really love about this game is that instead of there just being one thing to grab, like most of these types of games, there's the number of players minus one. So everyone will grab a walnut or a cashew nut except for one player. So it's not about being the fastest, it's just about not being the slowest. And I really like, it's just such a simple change, but it, it changes the balance of the game massively because in a game like Ghost Splits and Jungle Speed and other, there's so many other games like that, so often there's just one player that is the fastest and they're a bit unplayable and everyone just gets a bit fed up because they have smashed the game and nobody else has got a look in. In Not So Fast, there's a lot more of a balance. But the other thing that I like about the game is that there's some variety. So you, you aren't just looking out for one thing. You kind of got to keep your mind open to seeing other things. If four walnuts or cashews come up, then you're racing to grab one of those. If four pistachios come up, you're also grabbing, but th there's only one pistachio nut. So that does then bring back in the feeling that you get from other games. I like that uh, twist. It's just, it again, just adds more variety to the game. And the way you get penalty points in this game is that you take the cards in front of the active player. So if it happens on my turn when I'm flipping cards, whoever lost takes those cards under their little penalty card. And so you're tracking and you're just getting negative points. You don't want those. The pistachio, if you win that, it allows you to give cards to the player that you would probably give it to the player that you think is winning, right? Who's got the least cards. So that's a nice balance. It means that the person who's really good isn't necessarily always just going to run away with it. If you get seven or eight of the same nut, then you have to grab the almond. And what happens there is you get to clear out all of your points, all of your negative points. So you're desperate to be able to grab that. It's like, it, it doesn't come up very often in the game, but if it does, it's just, it's so brilliant for the player that it happens to. Whilst all that's happening, there's another thing that you have to look out for, and that is these blue cards that have one, two, or three on them, and they represent these poses. So there's a whole another element to the game, which is that as soon as one of those cards come out, there's no grabbing or anything, you have to make a pose. And so there are cards laid out at the start of each round that tell you which pose relates to number one, to number two, number three. So you might have to do something like this. And it's the last person to make the pose. So you are having to watch everyone else and see who's the slowest. It's brilliant because it switches your brain. It, it feels like they've really taken this type of game, which is so simple and so kid-friendly and family-friendly and such a basic idea, and just really kind of thought about it and thought, okay, so, you are focused on this one thing the whole time. You're looking for the nuts. You're, you're kind of so close to grabbing a nut. And then it's forcing your brain to completely switch gears and to think about actually, oh, now I've got to do a pose, but which pose? Because there's three of them. And am I remembering the pose from the last round because they get changed each round? If you can't already tell, I've absolutely loved this game. So is everyone that I've played it with. 
I was surprised, absolutely kind of shocked almost that there's still ways to kind of innovate with this type of game because I don't know, it just seems so thin of an idea that how can you keep coming up with new cool ways to make it interesting and fun and yet this could well be my favorite type of speed reaction game. I think it's brilliant. I think that the wooden nut pieces are so cute, but also just really well made and, and just nice to kind of grab. I, I can't say anything bad about it really for this type of game. So if you like the sound of it, you should absolutely try Not So Fast, which gets a seal of actual love. It's great. Sakura is a game from Osprey Games and designer Reiner Knizia. This is a simple card game where with a really silly theme, which is that you are painters trying to paint a Japanese emperor. He's walking around his favorite cherry blossom garden and you are trying to get as close as possible to paint him when he's in the right spot beneath the cherry blossom tree, but you're competing with the other painters to kind of be closest to him. If you bump into him because you get too close, you're too overzealous, then that is not gonna go well and you're gonna lose points. The way that works is that you have this little board that shows um, the emperor is going to be walking through his garden. So it's effectively just a track that he's moving along and you are represented by a pawn and you are following him around this garden and you do that by playing cards all at the same time. So you all have a hand of five cards and they have different movement things on. So you might move the emperor forward or backwards one space. Uh, you might move yourself forward a number of spaces. Sometimes it's an option whether you move forward or backwards and then there are other some There's some other interesting moves about moving the person who's first backwards or the person that's in last forwards and things like that, but you're basically Programming that card then all revealing and then they they go in order of the number in the bottom corner So there's a number that would determine which card goes first and so then you all carry out those actions and so you'll see you'll be jumping around each other you can't ever be on the same spot so if you were to move forward one space but there are other people in front of you then you might jump all of them the way you're trying to get more points is by being the closest at the right time and so as you're moving the emperor forward are you ready to move him onto the spot when people are going to score the points because are you in the spot to score the most points? The person in first gets three points, then two, then one, and anyone behind that gets nothing. And it's really important because it's a really low scoring game. So not only do you want to get points, you want to not lose them. It's definitely a chaotic kind of, there is a certain level of silliness to it. You can't control everything. You have to give in to some of that chaos. And I, I like that in games. Sometimes it can be too much. I think Sakura has a good amount of it. It's a short game for sure as well. So you're not gonna be too frustrated. You're just kind of laughing at everything happens. There's also some meanness to it because if somebody is right next to the emperor, then of course you're gonna play the card that brings the emperor backwards and walks into that player because they get shoved backwards and lose a point. I think that some players might assume that there's less tactics than there are. I think the order in which your card gets played is really important. Uh, it reminds me a bit of Six Nymphed. If you've played that game, people can dismiss that as having no kind of tactics or strategy. And I would completely disagree with that and proven by the fact that when I play it with newbies, I always tend to win or do really well. And in Sakura, I think there's a little bit of that because you can sort of see, okay, I've got no good cards, but maybe if I play one that's gonna activate really uh, late in the in the play loads of other chaos will happen first and I'll kind of I will be saved by other people's actions and then I think there's also you can keep cards in your hand for the whole game so it's about knowing the right time to play those really good cards those cards with the low numbers that are going to get you want to play just before the emperor is about to score points so then you can take the action before anyone else and they just get screwed over. So I, I've had fun with this game. We've played it a bunch. It's nice and short, nice small box. The cards were a bit rubbish to shuffle I found, so I've just sleeved them and, and that's fixed that. Um, it's got some really nice artwork in one of these um, nice small boxes from Osprey Games. So I would recommend this game. It's definitely staying in my collection for now um, because it does something different to any game that I have. It has this nice push or luck and it has this nice kind of thematic story to what is effectively a filler game. That's Sakura.
Hot Shots is a cooperative game about fighting forest fires. You are characters that are moving around this forest and trying to put out the fire by rolling dice. On each of the hexes, there's a, a set of symbols that you need to get. So you will roll the dice, trying to get those symbols. Every time you roll the dice, you have to set aside uh, a symbol. You can set aside more. So if you ever roll and don't get anything, then you effectively go bust and then the fire will get worse and you don't put it out. You are trying to keep rolling the dice because you need to get four, five or six symbols to actually get rid of any fire tokens, which are represented by all these nice plastic tokens on the board. And of course that isn't always easy and so there's a real push your luck element to it. You might get four symbols which allows you to get rid of one fire, but can you push on and get more? Um, and is it worth taking that risk? You, are, you can mitigate that risk a little bit by allowing yourself some re-rolls, either by being adjacent to the lake tile that's in the game, or by being on a tile with another player. So there's a bit of cooperation with kind of being on tiles together. What I like about some of the tiles is that they got some character to them. So you've got this petrol tanker that can kind of blow up. It's, it's really um, volatile and it will blow up and kind of cause fire around it. Uh, there's also a wind system, so the wind is pointing in a certain direction, shown by this little wind uh, sock, and that can change throughout the game, but when the fire increases at the end of each turn sometimes, um, it will get blown in that direction, and so you have to worry about the wind traveling in certain directions. Is that going towards hexes that you need to worry about? When the fire reaches a certain level on a hex, it's scorched, and so that, that hex is then ruined. And if you ever reach, I think it's eight scorched tiles, then you've lost the game. So you're trying to not have too many go scorched. You're trying to keep the fire under control. The way you win the game is by getting rid of all the fire, by putting it out completely, which is a nice thematic touch because generally, like in something like Pandemic, it's always a bit frustrating that you don't actually solve all of the disease in the world. Uh, in Hot Shots, you do have to put out the, all the fire. And the way that works is because as things get harder, as you scorch more tiles, there's actually less fire because when a tile scorches, whilst it does spread to surrounding tiles, it's no longer on that tile anymore. So it's a kind of interesting thing that the game kind of gets easier and harder at the same time you reach this point. It does feel a little bit like it gets a bit less climactic because you can have a lot of fire on a tile and then when they scorch there's suddenly like less of a threat on the board but you are at least you are a closer to losing the game for sure. The one real downside of the game is that it has some really ugly graphic design to it. The artwork is okay, um, I think it's decent, but the box is just just looks like it's out of the 90s. And then the tiles are also hampered by, and the cards as well, just some really ugly graphic design. You've gotta be trying harder than that because I think it's costing you the success of the game. People are gonna look at that box and they are gonna not give it as much credit as it deserves, I think, for the design that's in there. I also think that the cards should have had writing on to make the gameplay smoother. So at the end of each round, much like in Pandemic and other cooperative games, you're going to flip a card and bad things are going to happen. So the fire's going to spread in certain places or the wind's going to blow it. And these are represented by symbols on the cards. I had a hard time remembering what those symbols did, especially when I would come back to the game each time. And so I'm spending time with what should be a simple game with my head in the rule book. I found that games of Hot Shots can go on a bit long and you can get frustrated by basically the right decision being to stay in the same spot on every turn and then just keep trying and keep trying on the next turn because often the fire will come back onto the same hex. And it doesn't have, for me, the cleverness of some cooperative games where you can really think out the puzzle and work out how best to use that power with that card and get to that spot. And that's what I love about original Pandemic. I think the Hot Shots is a, is a fine game, let down by a few things. I, I can recommend trying it if you like uh, cooperative games, if you really love the theme. I don't think it's a bad design by any stretch, but it just didn't, it didn't, wasn't quite enough to stay in my collection. That's Hot Shots.
There are links to where you can buy all of the games in the description below. If you'd like to help Actualol grow bigger and better, go to patreon.com forward slash Actualol. I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.